It has been another deadly week in the United States, as gun violence shattered families and communities across the country. In one of the most shocking cases, a white homeowner in Kansas City shot a black teenager in the head who rang his doorbell by mistake. Prosecutors say 84-year-old Andrew Lester exchanged no words with 16-year-old Ralph Yarl before opening fire on him through a glass door, striking him in the chest and head. Yarl had simply gone to the wrong house to pick up his younger twin brothers. Yarl survived. He's now recovering from a traumatic brain injury. The shooter's grandson appeared on CNN Thursday and described his grandfather as a racist who avidly watched Fox News and embraced conspiracy theories. Meanwhile, in New York, a 65-year-old man has been charged with second-degree murder for fatally shooting a 20-year-old woman named Kaylin Gillis, who'd mistakenly pulled into the wrong driveway. In Elgin, Texas, two cheerleaders were shot by a man in a parking lot of a grocery store on Tuesday after one of them mistakenly tried to get into his car, thinking it was her own. Meanwhile, a North Carolina man has turned himself in after shooting a six-year-old and her parents after the girl tried to re retrieve a basketball that had rolled into the man's yard. The number of mass shootings in the United States this year has now reached 166. On average, there's been more than one mass shooting every day this year in the United States. In Alabama, six people have been arrested on murder charges in connection with the recent mass shooting at a Sweet 16 birthday party in Dadeville, Alabama, that left four people dead and 32 injured. Over the weekend, the National Rifle Association held its annual convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, less than two hours from Louisville, Kentucky, where a gunman armed with an AR-15-style semi-automatic assault rifle killed five people at a bank where he used to work, April 10th. To talk more about the gun epidemic in the United States, we're joined now by Andrew McKevitt. Associate Professor of History at Louisiana Tech University, author of the forthcoming book, Gun Country, Gun Capitalism, Culture and Control in Cold War America. Drew, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, though under horrible circumstances. Um, <clears throat> why don't we start off where I just left off, and that is, as you have one mass shooting after another, right, Louisville followed Nashville, where six people were killed, three of them nine-year-olds and three adults. The NRA holds its meeting. Republican presidential wannabes flock to that meeting. It is less than two hours from Louisville, where a mass shooting had just taken place. Can you put this all in context for us? Sure, Amy. Well, thanks so much for having me. And uh, I do wish this were not the kind of conversation we were having, but it does seem uh, inevitable and perennial at this point. Um, I do think, I think, to put this in some context, I think we talk about our gun problem all wrong. Uh, I think this, this, the, the, the way we talk about it and the precise language we use to talk about these problems is the kind of language that the NRA and the gun lobby wants us to use. Uh, we often think about our gun problem in the language of rights and the, the law and the Second Amendment. Uh, we adopt the language of good guys with guns and bad guys with guns and the so-called law-abiding citizen. Uh, and when we do that, we're using the very same language that they've crafted to understand these uh, these crises that we're we're seeing more and more. Uh, instead, uh, as I as I said at the beginning, there, I I think we ought to conceive of our gun problem as a problem of gun capitalism. That is, as a material problem. We are rapidly approaching the point at which we will be a country of a half billion guns. That will happen before the end of this decade. Uh, and I don't think it's possible to conceive of solutions to our gun problems without that larger, uh, without recognizing that larger materiality of guns in which we live, in which we are effectively swimming. So you're talking about more guns than people in the United States. Uh, I want to go to this issue of the NRA just a day after the five people were killed in a mass shooting uh, in neighboring Kentucky. Indiana Senate Republicans honored 
NRA chief Wayne LaPierre ahead of the NRA's in annual convention in Indianapolis. Moms Demand Action responded in a report by WTHR 13. They have the audacity, the audacity to stand on the floor of our Senate in our state house and honor the organization that far and away is most responsible for the proliferation of guns in our country. It's really a painful reminder that the Republican Party of the state of Indiana doesn't care. 13 News asked LaPierre directly about the criticism. We think all the federal gun laws ought to be enforced and we could dramatically reduce crime in America. That last voice, Wayne LaPierre. Well, at the NRA convention, Donald Trump gave the keynote address and called for firearms training for teachers. I will also create a new tax credit to reimburse any teacher for the full cost of a concealed carry firearm and training from highly qualified experts. Who's better? Who's better? If even 5 percent of teachers, people that are skilled with arms, we want that, 5 percent were voluntarily armed and trained to stop active shooters, we would achieve effective deterrence and the problem would cease to exist. Your response to President Trump? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know where the evidence for that claim comes from. We don't have any, any, we don't have any evidence that arming teachers in schools prevents mass shootings, will be a deterrent in any way, particularly for mass shooters who are often motivated, uh, who see what they're doing as a sort of end game kind of action, that they intend their lives to end in those particular instances. And so arming teachers is in no way going to be a deterrent. Um, but I think more broadly, these comments speak to the, the extent to which guns are simply the material reality in which in which we live, particularly when it comes to things like handguns. Uh, this is a conversation we don't often have so so much because we're, we're so often focused on these, these fearsome assault weapons uh, that have now become the, the target of, of even President Biden. Um, but instead, thinking of, of uh, this problem more in terms of the, the sort of mundane and commonplace relationship we have with firearms, such that it it makes perfectly sense to many people in this country, in certain parts of this country, to suggest that teachers go to school armed, because those teachers already live in communities flooded with guns, and they don't think uh, uh, they they don't think it it, it would uh, uh, violate any sort of moral or ethical norms for those teachers to go to school armed. I mean, Drew McEvitt. I mean, look, can you have a more gun-friendly state than Texas? And look what happened in Uvalde, as child after child was gunned down, as SWAT teams, troopers, police, all of them, more than a hundred of them, waited for an hour. Talk about fully armed. We're talking about military-level arming. And they wouldn't move forward. And yet you expect to have teachers? Right. Teachers with, with essentially no or little training, the equivalent of perhaps the kind of training you might get in a concealed carry uh, class or self-defense class or something like that, not something like the kind of training you might expect police officers to go through, many police officers, too, who've also had, had sort of military training. So the, the idea that we would arm teachers is, is simply absurd. When I think about my campus, I don't want anyone on my campus armed, including any of the teachers, and I don't want myself armed. I think uh, beyond the very obvious mechanics of, of potential violence that that uh, creates, there's also that that notion of, of intimidation and um, the, the the already the power relationships that already exist between students and faculty or students and faculty and administrators and introducing guns into that equation is just uh, uh, insane to my and thinking. And, of course, what it does, for those that are promoting it, it's just buying more guns. Um, can you talk about the arming of Wayne Le the honoring of Wayne LaPierre? Um, this is the NRA, well known for its corruption near bankruptcy. How does it possibly maintain the power 
over state and federal uh, public officials that do not represent even the um, NRA membership. Um, is for levels of gun control. I mean, for example, in Colorado now, um, the legislature just failed to pass an assault weapons ban, despite having a Democratic-controlled House, Senate and governor. Several House Democrats sided with Republicans to kill the bill in committee at 1 a.m. two nights ago. Yeah, so I, th I think the NRA's power comes from three places. Uh, one is the one to which we usually point, which is money. Uh, the NRA can dump hundreds of millions of dollars into elections and obviously has been doing that for a long time now. Uh, though I think we tend to overestimate that a bit. The other two ways in which the NRA can wield this kind of power are a little more uh, uh, subtle. One is the way in which they're able to rally their base very quickly. They've been able to do this since the 1960s. They were one of the pioneers of direct mail campaigning and so forth, that was able to rally a, a upwards of a million people already by 1968 to write their Congress people, to, to uh, lobby their local and state politicians, to vote against potential federal and state uh, 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 legislation. Uh, and the third way, which is the one we don't talk about and, and we don't really want to talk about, is that the NRA re really wields a lot of intimidation. Uh, and power in that sense. There are, I am confident, politicians who will not cross the NRA, not because of the money issue and not because of the vote issue, but because they're afraid of violence, but because, because they're afraid of the kind of violence that social violence and political violence that the NRA could encourage if it wanted to. You Talk about the connection between guns and gun capitalism. What does capitalism have to do with it, Drew? That's central to your forthcoming book. Yeah. So, so I and again here, my argument is that I think we focus a little too much on on questions of rights and abstract concepts like the interpretation of the Second Amendment, and not quite enough on just how much gun capitalism exploded, expanded in the post-war era especially. Uh, this goes back to the end of the Second World War. And, and in the 1950s and the 1960s, we see this incredible expansion of gun consumerism in the United States. In 19... There's about 45 million... Uh, we're having a little trouble with um, <laughs> with the internet. Um, a tree fell on uh, Drew McEvitt's house, so uh, there are some problems there. But I wanted to go to Tennessee, um, as Tennessee is reeling. Um, uh, legislators push this week to pass laws that shield gun manufacturers instead of children. Um, there is this 2005 law, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, um, uh, that uh, protected gun manufacturers. We only have a few more minutes, Drew, um, but if you, you got cut off right in the middle of you making that connection between this massive proliferation of guns in America. I mean, we don't see anything like this in any industrialized country in the world. The connection between that and capitalism. Yeah, that's right. And, and bringing the world in is a really important component there, too, because it's, it's partly the world that helps arm Americans after World War II. We often think of how the United States is responsible for the prolifer pro proliferation of weapons and violence after the Second World War, which is, of course, all true throughout the Cold War. But more so, arms come into the United States after the Second World War, and the American population is armed with the weapons that had been used in the Second World War and left over on battlefields in Europe and Asia. There's a whole uh, cohort of wily entrepreneurs, gun entrepreneurs, who maximize the profits they can get by grabbing these guns from Europe, sometimes for as cheap as less than a dollar each, bringing them over to the United States, and then selling them to an eager population uh, now, increasingly, after the Second World War, with more leisure time, with more uh, uh, money, uh, uh, more income available for those kinds of 
activities. And of course, the most famous of these war surplus imports, there are millions of them that come into the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. The most famous of these is the Carcano rifle used by Lee Harvey Oswald to kill John F. Kennedy in 1963. But it's just one of millions that come into the country and truly remake the consumer market for guns in the United States. And they do that in two ways. They, they, one, they make it one centered around war and firearms that have been involved in war and firearms that can be used for war. And that's where we get, uh, that's where we see the trajectory leading to something like the popularity of the AR-15. And then the other aspect is that it simply emphasizes cheapness. Uh, American consumerism drives down the price of these guns and a $10 gun becomes just as accessible as a $150 gun. And that's going to dramatically expand the gun market. As I said, the number of guns in the United States doubles every 25 years or so after the end of the Second World War, precisely because of that phenomenon. And then you have the other way, uh, it going the other way. I mean, you've got the gun violence in the United States and the U.S. involvement in international small arms trade and trafficking and refusing to sign off on being an obstacle at the U.N. to sign off on treaties that would limit small guns in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if we look back at the process in the United Nations beginning in the, the mid-1990s and leading all the way up to finally the signing of a completely watered-down treaty in 2013, we saw the, the real powerful influence of the NRA there, and in particular, in particular the NRA's kind of bulldog, John Bolton, uh, who went to the UN in 2001 and tried to shut down every international effort that would have uh, created any kind of substantive controls on international small arms sales. And then, uh, very quickly, two issues. Tennessee. I mean, uh, perhaps the trying to get rid of the two youngest black lawmakers, the Republican House Speaker and his allies in the Tennessee legislature, uh, was about trying to prevent uh, the push for gun control in Tennessee, which so many support, though you wouldn't know it within the legislature. And now, while they're not protecting the children, they want to protect the arms industry, a bill that's now going to Bill Lee's desk, the Tennessee governor, who signed off on a gun deregulation bill in a Beretta gun factory. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had heard you mention the, the 2005 law, the protection of Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, uh, which already shields law, uh, which already shields gun makers uh, from liability in a number of ways, and that law was written in the wave in the, in the wake of a, a wave of lawsuits against gun makers by gun control organizations, by large municipalities that sought to force the gun makers to pay for the consequences of the seemingly uncontrolled proliferation of firearms that was. Uh, uh, dramatically, uh, that had ticked up dramatically in the early 1990s. In addition to the very obvious human trauma, there are, of course, economic costs to gun violence as well. And so the, the PCLAA, uh, or the PLCAA, the intention of that was to shield gun makers nationally. Uh, and of course, it's signed into law by the George W. Bush administration so that gun makers could not be sued for their guns working as they are designed to maim and kill human beings. What the Tennessee legislature is doing, I think, is essentially a, a kind of lip service to, uh, or, or it's essentially a moot point in that there are already those protections in place. But I also think the Tennessee legislature watched what happened last year within the Remington case, uh, when Remington, the, the, the rifle maker Remington, was uh, settled with the Sandy Hook families for $73 million. Um, and that's what they're trying to prevent, gun control organizations, uh, and activists from looking for loopholes in the, the 2005 law, like, for instance, in the case of Sandy Hook, targeting their advertising rather than the guns themselves. Uh, and Tennessee wants to cut that off, because ultimately the, the sanctity of gun capitalism must remain secure. Um, Drew McEvitt, I want to thank you so much for being with us, author of the forthcoming book, Gun Country, Gun Capitalism, Culture and Control in Cold War America, speaking to us from Shreveport, where he's an associate professor of history at Louisiana Tech University.